Welcome searchers and seekers. We are embarking on our study of the Gospel of Luke, the third gospel. Now it is called the Gospel according to Luke, but we really do not know who wrote it. The name Luke was attributed to this text many, many decades after it was written. Um, probably around the year 150, so many, many years after it was written. So we don't know who wrote this text. Um, it's anonymous. Um, we do know some things about the writer uh, of this text. We know some things about this anonymous writer. He was a great uh, Greek writer. Uh, he's very literate, knowledgeable about the Septuagint or the Greek Old Testament, the Greek version of the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, but we don't know uh, who he was, really. We don't know much about him except what we can garner from the text. We don't know when it was written. Uh, really, it could be any time from the year 75 to 110. We don't know. Uh, most scholars suggest somewhere between 80 and 100. We also don't know where it was written. Um, probably not Palestine because... Luke makes some mistakes of geography, uh, and uh, we'll look at those later. So he probably was not a resident of Palestine, uh, Samaria, or Judea, probably outside of that area. Could be Asia Minor, could be Greece. Uh, so we don't know um, when or where or who wrote it. Uh, we don't know who it's addressed, uh, whom it's addressed to either uh, except uh, those who wanted more information about Jesus who was being accepted as the Messiah. So when you pull all that together that does not create a lot of evidence for the historical value of, of this text. Um, it is not an eyewitness account and in fact we know that from Luke because he gets some information he says uh, from those who were uh, originally eyewitnesses um, back uh, several decades later. So this is a time probably decades after the death of Jesus that this material is being written down. We also uh, believe that he had uh, most of the Gospel of Mark, again who is anonymous, uh, because Luke uh, rewrites many of his um, stories and parables pretty much exactly, but improves the language and makes some changes. So he, he had Mark, and he probably had a list of sayings of Jesus that scholars call Q. Um, but again, very little accurate information about who, when, and where of this gospel. Verses 1 through 4 are actually one long Greek sentence. So right off the bat, you get a sense that Luke knows the arts of rhetoric, and he can write a complex, informative sentence that is also clear and uh, makes sense in each of its dependent clauses. So he's a very, very good writer, can write long, complex sentences right off the bat, verses 1 through 4, are actually one long sentence. In chapter 2, verse 22, it is said that the time came for their purification in the temple. And scholars suggest that, that that's a mistake. Uh, only Jesus, only the firstborn, would be purified at the table, not there. So it should be his, which leads scholars to think that the person, Luke, who wrote this, made a little mistake uh, about Jewish practice. So he's probably not raised in a Jewish family. So he is... Uh, either directly a convert to Christianity or somebody who was a convert to Judaism and then to Christianity. There are a couple of place places where scholars tell us that Luke made a mistake in the geography of the area as he was telling the story of Jesus. One of these is chapter 4, verse 44. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. However, he was in Galilee at the time, the cities that are mentioned there. So scholars suggest this may be a, a mistake. Another one is 
chapter 17, verse 11. So this leads some scholars to believe these, these are mistakes uh, and that this is evidence that Luke was not familiar with the geography of the area. So maybe he was writing from Greece or Asia Minor and he knew the names but didn't know exactly where the, how they were related geographically. In chapter 1 verse 5, talking about John the Baptist, Luke writes, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is not an explicit Trinitarian adjective or uh, descriptor of God. The Holy Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, is talked about in this text in many ways. It's not clear at all that this has anything to do with a Trinitarian statement. Um, this is the idea that being filled with the Spirit, it, it's as simple as that, being filled with the Spirit of God, and it's called the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit of God. And in chapter 1, verse 19, the angel Gabriel brings this message. And he says that he brings a message of good news. So an angel is an angelos. And bringing the good news, we know it as the, uh, as the gospel. Uh, but good news is euangelion. Euangelion. Uh, so that is the, the good news, and that's what people often take uh, as being translated by the gospel, the good news. It's literally good news here, and it's news, uh, anglos, delivered uh, by an anglos, by an angel. An angel is a messenger in Greek. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, doesn't immediately believe the message, so he is struck mute. He can no longer talk. Uh, so that is one of the, the little miracles of Luke that, to my mind, leads to a little bit less historicity. Gabriel then goes to Mary in verses 26 and following. And the text makes clear that Mary is engaged to Joseph, who is of the house of David. And that will become important in a few verses. The Lord is with you, Gabriel says. So the Lord here is referring to God. So God can be referred to as Lord. And we will see many different uses of the word Lord. So I'm calling our attention to that. And it is clear in verse 32 that he will be called the Son of the Most High. And God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. So that's why it's important that he be a, a um, progeny of David. So this is the Davidic Messiah. This is the promise that a son of David will become the new Messiah. So this is very clear in the, the Gospel of Luke that you, the reader is being told immediately. Jesus is the Messiah. In verse 35, we see the virgin birth that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So sort of hover over you like a God's presence over Mount Sinai, this overshadowing presence. And um, this is called the Holy Spirit. So this is the Spirit of God. It's really not in any sense Trinitarian here. This is just the Holy Spirit. And this makes Jesus holy also. Um, and many cultures have these kind of uh, miraculous birth stories of religious leaders, such as the Buddha. In verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greetings, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So one gets a sense that the, the Holy Spirit can fill people, can be a presence to them, uh, can sort of... Uh, become a, a union with them in some way, uh, that, that the presence of God is really known and experienced as a presence to and in people. Um, 
this is the idea that John the Baptist leapt in her womb when Jesus was there. Um, it's another one, uh, one of these little miracles. Um, and you can see how it makes sense. Although, as I look at it rationally, over the years, it becomes less and less of a believable miracle. Um, and because really, how is the, the baby uh, in Elizabeth's uterus to know that uh, Jesus is there? Um, that really doesn't make sense. Uh, a fetus can't really think that clearly. Uh, it, it's just sort of a, um, a miracle. It's a, it's a sweet little miracle story, but I find it, as I reflect upon it, very unbelievable. In verse 67, we have Zechariah, who is filled by the Holy Spirit and then spoke a prophecy. So again, we have this idea of people being filled by the Spirit, and then that results in them uh, singing a song or prayer, or praise to God. In verse 76, John the Baptist is described that he will be a prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. So this would be the Lord Jesus. So this is that same Greek word, Koryos, or Lord. So Jesus is being referred to as Lord in this sense. And the Greek word can mean many different things. It can refer to God. It can refer to an earthly ruler, such as a king, or um, a master or prophet, such as Jesus, uh, or even uh, the Lord of the under underworld or the Lord of this world. Uh, so it's a word that has many different uses. So let's wrap up our discussion of chapter one of Luke. And I am relying on some of the work of Raymond Brown for some of these comments. Uh, Raymond Brown says that there is actually no New Testament reference that is very uh, undeniable to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70. So that really is an amazing um, fact uh, that the New Testament does not mention the, de the destruction by the Romans of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, that, that would have been widely known and would have had a great impact on the self-understanding of Jewish people and also of Christian people. Additionally, um, although many scholars like to date Luke to 80 to 100, some date Luke into the second century as late as 150, uh, which would be more than 100 years after the death of Christ. Um, and Christ, Jesus was a historical figure uh, in, in, all, in all, most accounts, yeah, there is historicity to this person, Jesus of Nazareth who was uh, crucified, uh, they would definitely not advertise such a horrific death. So that's probably uh, what happened his historically. But if the gospel is written as far as 150, uh, that distances this gospel uh, from the actual events. And of course, it's a minority view, uh, but there's really no way to show that it's impossible. So when we're talking about possible dates, possible places, of the gospel being written, uh, being composed. Uh, many of these are merely suggestions. In the birth narrative, Gabriel is mentioned more than once, and Gabriel is only mentioned in the book of Daniel, which seems to be very important, a prophetic book uh, that describes God's final plan, uh, where there'll be this, this massive change and God's uh, rule will be uh, established. Daniel 9, 24 talks about um, vision and prophecy being ratified and a holy of holies will be anointed. And uh, the book of Malachi, another prophetic book, uh, talks about Elijah coming before the Lord. And that is in Malachi 3, 23, lo, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord comes, the great and terrible day. And that is why this gospel talks about Elijah. And 
John the Baptist as Elijah. And what about the differences in the Gospel of Mark and Luke on Jesus? So if we assume Luke had the entire Gospel of Mark, which is an assumption, it's interesting, it is interesting to see which passages Luke decided not to include in his version. And he seems to uh, want a more rever a reverential, calmer uh, Jesus uh, not one who is prone to emotions, not one who is stern or angry. So Luke removes Mark 141 where Jesus is moved with pity or is stern. 439 where Jesus speaks directly to the sea. Mark 1014 where Jesus is indignant. Mark 1115 where Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers. And Mark 11 where Jesus curses a fig tree. So all of these are times where uh, Jesus is uh, very direct, stern, even angry. And Luke decides not to include them, although they are in the, the Gospel of Mark. So that's a, a very interesting um, editorial uh, decisions being made about what type of Christ Luke is interested in and I thank Raymond Brown for uh, listing those.